So today's topic is on, on stable curves. It's the 14th lecture of the course. And I, I have pictured here an example of a stable curve. We'll, we'll introduce the, the definition formally, but you should sort of see through this example that it's condition that every rational curve meets the rest of the curve at, at least uh, three points. And note that we, we were like writing these numbers here to indicate the sort of the geometric genus of the, of the components. And we had this nice formula last time to compute the, the like the arithmetic genus of the total curve using, but, but you just take the sum of, of the geometric genus of the components and then you add sort of the number of, of connected components bounded by this graph. And you, in this example, you get 14. Right, but before we can introduce stable curves, I wanna give a, a quick refresher on our definitions. And so let's just review properties of nodes. So last time we introduced, so yeah, here C is a curve over a field. And in the, in the case when it's algebraically closed, uh, we say that a point as a node, if the complete local ring has this, is, is isomorphic to the power series ring in two variables, mod the, the two axes, x, y. And then in general, it may not have this form. Uh, so you need to, uh, you, you ask that there's a point in the, in the base change to the algebraic closure that there's a node over your given point. So maybe an example of why you need to consider these two cases is that if you take C as a curve over the real numbers and you say mod out by x squared plus y squared. This is irreducible over R, but not over C. And so it's, it's a node. And we see like after the base change, the node becomes what you might say split. I.e. the, the completion is, is, is isomorphic to this power series ring. And then, uh, yeah, and then we say a curve is nodal if all points are either smooth or nodal. Or nodal. Any questions on that? Right, and then the, the main result we had last time uh, is, this, is this local structure theorem, uh, which tells you not, not just how nodes look like in, in, a, in a curve over a field, but also what they look like in families. So we, we have a sort of a general setup that we're considering just a morphism that's flat and finitely presented where every fiber is, is, uh, is a curve. And then if you have an, a, a point, which is a node in the fiber, and in particular, that means that the, the, that the, uh, the fiber is reduced at that point, then, then, there, then a tau locally, you, you, uh, you have such a, a, a diagram. And I have a little. Maybe to, was there a question? I have a little question, which is, uh, so when away from a node, this power series ring is just in one variable? Is that like this completion is just the power series in one variable? Exactly, yes. Just checking, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah that, that's an important point that for a smooth, so yeah, for a smooth point, the, the, the complete local ring is a power series ring in, in one variable. Right, and let's just like, let's just spell out what this tells us in, in, in the case that the base is a field. Then this theorem implies that there exists. So an tau extension of a field is a, a finite separable field extension. And there's a, a point P prime in the base change uh, such that the complete local ring, in this case, of P prime is isomorphic to the power series ring. And this is sort of a stepping stone of how we, how we prove this theorem as well. We went from like, understanding what the completion looked like in the fiber to the completion looked like in, in the entire family. Uh, and the, the basic example to keep in mind of what the structure theorem looks like for now in the, in the relative setting. 
So for it, it is perhaps this example where you take x, y, uh, and t over t. So here, here you're, you're, you have a one-dimensional family where when t is zero, the fiber just looks like the union of the two axes. But, but away from that, it looks like the uh, hyperbolas, which are smooth. And what, what the theorem says, essentially, is that every deformation of a node, a tau locally looks like this, uh, is the pullback. of this example. Namely that there is, so I, I maybe, yeah, let me just replace this K with a Z so that we can really work in mixed characteristic. So what it says is then that there's a, a morphism from spec A to here, and then T pulls back to some function F, and then the base change is this spec A X, Y, x, y minus f. And so at how locally your curve C looks like, looks like yeah, this particularly nice form. And uh, and maybe I should, I, I wanted to quickly say that what, what uh, so he, yeah, on the left hand side, I reminded you what, what, the, uh, what the theorem is and the uh, what we proved. And on the right hand side, I sort of have a variant uh, when the central fiber is non reduced. So, and so even if the central fiber is non reduced, but support, let's suppose that your point in the reduction is nodal, uh, then there's a similar sort of stu structure result. And I'm going to use this later, which is why I'm stating it. And I'm only going to use it in this restrictive setting where uh, R is a DVR. And then you have a family of curves where the total family is regular. This map is flat and finitely presented. And, and so like we have these two different cases of whether if the point is smooth, then it essentially just looks, looks like a thickened affine line. Uh, and then when, when it's a node, then you, you, you're, you, basically you can have exponents A and B inside here. So that it's like the central fiber is just yeah, it's a union of thickened axes, perhaps with different weights. But we'll, we'll use, we'll, yeah, we'll use that later when we discuss stable reduction. Um, but when, maybe I should say one of the applications of this result for us is, is as follows. Uh, so, so we have this result, and I, I should point out that. This, this is definitely more than we need. Uh, especially, yeah, especially for the applications I'm gonna give right now. But the reason I'm including it in this form is because I, I find it like a conceptual, gives us a conceptual understanding of nodes and their deformations. Uh, so, it, and, and the proof is quite involved. And, and in fact, yeah, there, there were details that I didn't present last time. So, so certainly I'm going to revisit this argument when I look again at my notes. But I did want to spell out these two, two like nice applications of this. Uh, and the first is, let's suppose we have a family of curves, C over S as in the theorem. So it's flat and finitely presented. And then let's, let's look at this locus in the total family of points, uh, of points that such that the point in its fiber is either smooth or nodal. And then the claim is that this is an open condition in the total family of C. And to prove this, well, first let's know that you know, if the point is smooth, we already know that the smooth locus is open. And, and so let's handle the case that if P is 
um, a node in the Fiverr. So here S is pi of P. Pi is the structure map. Then what this theorem gives us is this nice tau, tau diagram up, up here. And it, so let, let's let this morphism from U to C be, uh, be called G. And then, then you just take, then, then we've sort of arranged that this point is in, because G is a tau, if I take G of U, this is an open set inside C node. All right, so the theorem gives us, gives us much more, but in particular it implies smoothness. But in this condition, I'm sorry, it implies openness of the nodal locus in the total family C. Uh, and if we want to get the openness of the nodal locus in the base, we, we need to impose a properties condition. So this is what I have over here. So if in addition, this is a proper family, then this nodal locus, then th this locus of points S, so that whose fiber is a nodal curve, is open. And this follows formally from the last one that this locus, nodal locus is identified sort of with the complement of the non-nodal locus. And this is the image of this locus here. So this here is the closed locus in C of non-nodes. And then because pi is proper, this is also closed. Yeah, and that's it. And, and the reason we like this kind of this result is because the, at least this last corollary allows us to apply it to the, to the moduli setting. So I, I've repeated, yeah, this corollary up here, nodal locus in the base is open. And next time we're going to apply this result to show that sort of if, if I define the stack of all nodal, at, at worst nodal curves, so here objects are going to be flat, finitely presented in proper families such that every fiber is nodal. We're going to, uh, we're going to use this to get that, yeah, to, to argue that the stack, this stack is algebraic. But, but there's problems with looking at all nodal curves even though it forms an algebraic stack, uh, it's not separated. And it, it's not even, and it's not bounded. Here, I mean, it's not gonna be finite type. And, and the, the reason for this sort of follows from uh, the value of criterion for separatedness. So let, let's just suppose we have a family of curves to generating to a nodal curve over a one dimensional base. So this is like a spectrum of a DVR, like in the value of criterion for separatedness. But I, what I can do is I can just blow up the node in this family and what that, what that, what that does in, so I'm blowing up a point in the surface and, and well, let's assume that the surface yeah, is, is regular. And what you get then is you, you insert a P1. So genus the zero curve. And so you, what, we've, what we've constructed is another way to fill in that family of smooth curves over the origin with a different nodal curve. And of course, you could keep repeating. I, I can then blow up a different node, and then you're going to get a family with two P1s. And you can keep repeating this as many times as you want. And so you see that there's infinitely, infinitely many limits of this smooth family uh, over where we're, where, where, yeah, over the smooth family of curves. So it's definitely not separated, and you can even use this to show that it's not bounded. So this suggests we should restrict to a smaller locus, and this is the reason we're going to introduce stable curves. So that's our motivation for, for introducing stable curves, which we'll do on the next slide, 
I think this is a good time to pause for questions. On the previous slide, um, or I guess on, on this slide even, uh, in the corollary, do you have a, a quick example where um, where I, I guess pi is not proper and then we end up with the nodal locus in the base uh, not being open? Uh, I should. Wait. Uh... I should, but I don't. Yeah. Let me okay. get back to you maybe after in the discussion section. And then, yes. yeah. Okay, so let me introduce stable curves now. So here's our definition. Um, well, first I'm gonna introduce pointed curves. So I'm not only gonna introduce stable curves, I'm gonna do it in the, in the pointed setting. So we're gonna, be, so we'll be able to discuss um, mg bar as and mg n bar. And so an n pointed curve over a field is just a curve, arbitrary curve. So a, a curve for us was uh, just pure one dimensional finite type scheme over a field. And, uh, and then we just have an ordered set of points, k points. This is a quite broad definition. And then uh, we're going to say a point of a curve is special uh, if it's either a node or a mark point. So we, we're going to treat mark points and nodes sort of on, on equal grounds. And so, yeah, now we get to the definition of a stable curve. And I should say, yeah, this, this, this definition was introduced by, uh, by Mumford and Meyer in the uh, 50s, early 60s. And I think there were some hints uh, uh, that this was a good notion coming from topology and other settings. I think even to Mumford and, to like, to, to Mumford and Deline, it wasn't clear whether this was the right notion and positive characteristic. And it was like, and, and at, but after their seminal paper, it was sort of, yeah, I think we take this back for granted now that stable curves is the right notion and that they form sort of nice proper family, proper algebraic stack. Anyway, so here, yeah, here's the definition of a stable family, of a stable curve. So it's an endpointed curve. And so we, we have our usual assumptions that C is connected, nodal, and projective. Uh, I should say geometrically connected over a non-algebraic proposed field. And then our points are distinct and smooth. So th these, are, these are important hypotheses, distinct and smooth. And then we have these two conditions, one and two. First one is that every smooth rational subcurve contains at least three special points. And then, every, there, and then there's no, that C itself is not a genus one curve with no marked points. I think it's best to look at this as, look at this as in, in examples over here. Maybe we should look, first look at uh, these bottom curves here. These are all not stable. And like in this case, this, this is not stable because it's a genus one curve with no marked points. We, we don't wanna, we, want, we don't wanna include that. And this, in this case, you've marked a node. You don't wanna do that. In this case, you, you, you two marked points are equal. We wanna disallow that. And here, in this case, we have a rational curve, subcurve meeting only at two points. And yeah, and we disallow that. On the other hand, up here are all examples of stable curves. And in these diagrams, I, I usually, I only put the, the geometric genus zero if it's like, if it's to, to remember that it's a rational subcurve. And so to note that in these definitions, there do not exist stable curves mm -hmm. If G n is equal to uh, 
zero. Like, is it zero, zero, one, zero, two, or one, zero? And, and this is equivalent to this numerical condition that sometimes we impose that 2g minus 2 plus n is less than or equal to zero. So we sometimes impose g minus 2 plus n. Sorry, this should be zero is greater than zero in, in order to avoid these special cases, in order to ensure that the moduli stack is, is not empty. Any questions? Yeah, so this is one of the, the critical de definitions for the remainder of the course. And my goal today is to, to motivate this definition and show that it has some nice properties. But let, let me just explain first some variants on this. So here, I, here I've defined stable. I can also define semi-stable, uh, where I replace the, the number three with two in condition one. So for instance, this example on the right-hand side is pre-stable, oh, no, sorry, is semi-stable. And then you can also call a pre-stable curve where you just drop one and two entirely. So, so it's essentially, it's just an end, it's just a nodal, it's just a proper connected nodal curve with distinct and smooth points. Right, and so clearly stable implies semi-stable implies pre-stable. Okay, so the, the first property I wanna show is that, the, that being stable is well-behaved with respect to the pointed normalization of the curve. So let's start with, let's just take uh, here, let's take C to be an end-pointed pre-stable curve over a field. So again, that, that just, that, that means already that the points PI are distinct and smooth in C. And then we take the pointed normalization C tilde uh, and uh, yeah, and no, note that, you know, since PI is smooth, it's pre-image uh, under the normalization is a unique, there's a unique point. And let's let the pre-image of the singular locus be denoted like this. So these are these are all the points in C tilde over nodes. And and uh, and the first exercise that I suggest is to show that C is stable, or that, yeah, the C is stable if and only if every connected component of the pointed normalization is stable. And, and yeah, I, rather than, than proving this, I'll just, I'll just give you an example. So let's suppose we have, uh, yeah, let's suppose we have our curve C and then we'll take the normalization. Suppose our, our, our curve C has three components. Suppose there's a curve like this and then in red there's this and then there's a rational curve. This maybe and with with a marked point here, but if you take the normalization, then there's three components, and on on the blue component, the pointed normalization is going to have uh, four nodes, right? This this gives you two points, and then there's these other two points. Well, I could even, let's just assume this is his genus four, this is genus two. Uh, 
And then, yeah, and the red component is going to have how many points? One, two, three, also four points. And the, the key here is, on, is for the rational subcurves. And this purple one has, uh, has yeah, has, also has three points. And so it's, it's, it's stable, both the curve itself and its point of normalization is stable. All right, and, uh, and so we're gonna, we, we're, we're after sort of an equivalent characterization of stability for pointed curves. And what, one of the facts we're gonna rely on is the following property for smooth curves. The only smooth end pointed curves, uh, C P1 to P N with the automorphism group uh, infinite are, are the following. Well, first I should tell you, yeah, in, in the pointed case, what do I mean here? This parameter has automorphisms of C with such that uh, that preserve the points. So automorphisms of pointed curves preserve the, uh, the points and, and, the, and their ordering, right? Doesn't, it doesn't move around the, the PIs, it fixes each PI. And so the only curves with positive dimensional with, uh, with infinite automorphism groups are either P1, where N can be zero, one, or two, or C is uh, a genus one curve. And N equals zero. And again, these, these are sort of the, the same conditions we saw earlier that 2G minus two plus N is less than or equal to zero. And so we're going to use this fact to prove the following proposition. So let the endpointed curve, uh, endpointed, yeah, uh, pre stable curve. Then the following are equivalent. One is that it's stable. Two is that the automorphism group is finite. And three, uh, the dualizing sheaf, which we introduced and, and gave an explicit description for last time, twisted by the points is ample. So this gives you really three different ways to think about stable curves and they're all, um, yeah, I would say equally important. Uh, this isn't a difficult fact. So let's just, in fact, like one and two, we, we've basically spelled out, they follow from the, the exercise on the left-hand side and the fact above, right? The only way that you can have a positive that you can have infinite dimensional automorphisms is, is if you're either a P1 or a genus one. And these are like exactly what we, the conditions we removed, yeah, uh, that we imposed in the definition of stability. For, for the equivalence with three, we need to use uh, one property of the dualizing sheet that I didn't mention last time. Let, so let me say it here. Uh, we're going to use the following fact that if C is a nodal curve and T inside C is a subcurve, then if I if I take omega C and I restrict it to T, it's the same as omega T twisted by the intersection points where T meets the rest of the curve, namely where T intersects its complement. 
So maybe on the left hand side here, like if, if T is, is the blue subcurve, what this implies is that omega C restricted to T is omega T uh, shifted by these two points, so Q1, Q2. Right, and so I'm going to now use this fact. So therefore, so uh, let's understand when is this when is this line bundle ample? Well, the normalization is a finite morphism. So this is the same as the pullback being ample. Uh, but you know the the the, the normalization is, the normalization is just a disjoint union of its components. So this is the same as saying for all connected components of the normalization that uh, omega c restricted to t should be equal to uh, omega t. Well, by, by this formula, this is the same as omega t. And now I only need to remember, I should only remember the points on t. And then I need to remember the intersection. And so this then is, is in, in turn equivalent to saying that for all these connected components that uh, t and the, the shift, okay, this is, running out of space, uh, is stable. And the final observation we need is that, you know, if I look up here at this fact I had for automorphism, for the finiteness of the automorphism group, is that this is the, this, it's the, the same, the same property, the same is true uh, for ampleness of omega C shifted by these points. Just this is the basic property of smooth curves that we, we know that, you know, uh, if that just on smooth curves, we know that you have a line bundle whose degree is positive and it's ample. And so this just boils down to a numerical condition because we, we know the degree of the dualizing sheet is 2G minus two, where you twist by point these points N. And so the only way that cannot be ample is either if the curve is P1 with two or less marked points or genus one, in which case the dualizing sheet is trivial. Right, so that I think that wraps up these th three three conditions. Uh, questions? Yeah, if you're interested in higher dimensional geometry, I think it's like uh, every aspect of when you try to define moduli of higher dimensional uh, varieties, there's there are there are issues, and so I, I think you should, yeah, and sort of de define like yeah, defining in defining stable families and defining dualizing sheets, and th there's uh, yeah, there's a lot of issues. It's the, ca the case of smooth uh, of curves is sort of the nicest where, yeah, where yeah, I mean we have really three nice way to three ways to think about stability. Okay, so we know that so we know for a stable curve that the, if I take omega c and twist by these points, it's ample. And just like with smooth curves, it's useful to know when it's very ample because then you can use this embedding for a variety of, of reasons. So I'll, I'll I'll just leave this as an exercise, uh, but I'll, I'll tell you essentially the, the strategy to do it. So we want to know that for a stable curve, that if I take a sufficiently high power of, of the dualizing sheaf twisted by the points, then it's very ample. And, and, and let's in this hint, let's just assume n is zero for simplicity. Just it makes the notation easier. And what we need to show is that omega c 
twisted by k separates points and tangent vectors. So that is, you know, if you just spell out what this means, to separate points, you need to you need for all points x and y of C, you need that there's enough global sections of omega C twisted by K so that this rejects onto So you need to show that that's rejected. And the second one is for all points then, x and c, that uh, you can separate tangent vectors. So you need enough sections so that it surjects onto omega c tensor k, tensored not by the residue field, but by the second power of the maximal ideal. So o c mod second power of the maximal ideal. Oops, that should be x. All right, and now both in A, both A, now you realize that both A and B come from uh, an exact sequence in cohomology. Uh, that namely, I could take, I have omega C, and I can tensor it with the maximal ideals of X and Y. And this is, sits inside this and then maps to the, the quotient. And A and B are A and B are uh, come are, are come from the yeah the, the, the global sections of this. So you see that it suffices, right? We, we need to show that H H zero of this is surjective. Uh, so it suffices to show that H one of C omega C tensored with K tensored M X M Y equals zero. And now here, this is for all X and Y and C, but actually possibly equal. So we've merged these two cases into this one vanishing of cohomology statement. But we have, but it involves a dualizing sheet. So you can use, you, oh yeah, we can, we can relate this to the Acer duality to the vanishing of the homomorphisms from MX, MY into, into this. And now the, the exercise is to show that this vanishes using sort of a case analysis of whether X and Y inside C are nodes or smooth. I think my next topic, I'm going to move on to like families of stable curves. So it's a good time for, for questions or comments if you have any. All right, so, so, so far we've just discussed stable curves over a field. Let's now move on to families of stable curves. So I've saved time by writing the definition here. And here, I, so last time I discussed nodal curves and we even had results about families of nodal curves, but I didn't, I didn't define what a family of nodal curves. And in the literature, when people use the word family, you should, uh, you should really ask exactly, you, you should look to see what exactly what they mean. I mean, a family should always mean flat, but then whether you include it to be proper uh, is, yeah, is uh, up to you. So, but for us, it, it will include it. So for us, a family of endpointed nodal curves is gonna be a flat, proper, and finitely presented morphism of schemes such that every geometric point, oh, together with n sections, 
such that every geometric fiber is a reduced connected nodal curve. No, I'm ha I have no conditions on whether these sections intersect or, or whether they land in a smooth locus. So this is not, a, yeah, it's not, the fibers are not necessarily the pre-stable curves that I defined. But now for, for stable curves, we impose, we just, yeah, a family of endpointed stable curves is simply a family of nodal curves such that every geometric fiber is stable. So that ensures that the sections are disjoint, that they land in the smooth locus, and that every fiber is, is, sta is stable. And we can give the same definitions if we want for, uh, for semi-stable and pre-stable. But now that we have this definition, we can define MGN bar as the pre-stack uh, where the objects uh, of MGN bar are families of, of smooth, stable families with N sections. Stable families, yeah, and stable endpointed families. And right, this is the stack over, the, yeah, the category of schemes, right? And this, this object lives over the scheme S. And morphisms are equal to Cartesian diagrams, preserving the section. Um, great, yeah, and you can check that yourself that it's a pre-stack, I mean, yeah. And uh, just like with families of, of, of smooth curves, on the right-hand side, I have this, a nice, uh, this nice property of, of, of families of, of, the analogous property for families of stable curves. But maybe to set this up, I need to talk first about, you know, the relative dualizing sheaf. And, uh, and so here we just use this, this yeah, there's this fact, depends what you want to use here. Uh, but if, if you have a pre-stable family, or even, or even a family of nodal curves, then C to, C to S is a local complete intersection. And this just, this implies that there exists a relative dualizing sheaf. Um, and maybe for like, this isn't in Hartshorn. It, uh, the, the, well, it is in one of Hartshorn's book. So maybe the reference is, is, is Hartshorn, but his residues in duality book. Uh, but in a more elementary way, it, it is in the, the, the introductory text by, by Lou on, on algebraic geometry and arithmetic curves. So it, kind of, it kind of looks, works just like the dualizing in, in the absolute case over a field. Uh, and, the, and the main property you need to know is that if you have sort of, if, if you have so a family of curves over S and a base change, then if I take the relative dualizing sheet and I restrict it and I pull it back to CT, it's, it, it's isomorphic to the relative dualizing sheet. In particular, you know, if I take the relative dualizing sheet and I restrict it to a fiber, then I get the relative dualizing sheet of that fiber. Ooh, okay, so yeah, uh, I won't really say much more about this existence or properties. That's a whole you know other topic. 
but I will, yeah, I will mention the following, the, the proposition that's written there, that is, the, is that the relative dualizing sheet um, is, uh, so yeah, so let me, let me walk you through this. So I have a family of endpointed stable curves of genus G, and then I take, I take the line bundle, which is the twist of the relative dualizing sheet by the sections. And because we're assuming the sections land in the smooth locus, you know, this forms the divisor. So, I, so this, yeah, this, this is legitimate. Then, yeah, and then since K is greater than or equal to three, if, if K is greater than or equal to three, then the statement is that this is relatively very ample. And, uh, and moreover, that the push forward is a vector bundle of a given length. And in fact, you know, the reason this is true is the same reason, we, the same way we prove this for smooth curves, like this, the, for the relative very ampleness, this condition can be checked on fibers. And that's what we proved on the last slide. To get that the push forward is a vector bundle here, you, you use, I mean, this is a standard application of cohomology based genes. And then to get at, at, at this number here, this is just a Riemann rock calculation. So can I ask you something? Mm -hmm. Already in the case of smooth curves, um, so what is uh, the global map to, uh, and we have the curve C and we want to embed C inside the sum P of uh, epsilon, say, that is this shift. What is, uh, how is this map defined globally? Meaning if I have just one curve, this is, uh, I take a base of uh, the sections and, okay. Yeah, I, I, well, I, are you saying that what, the, I mean, I think it works the same as with, 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 uh, with smooth curves, right? Like if you have your curve C over base, you do this construction and it embeds into the, the projectivization of the push forward of this line bundle twisted by Okay. Yes, and my question is, how is defined the map from C to P? Of, how is that map defined? Oh, I mean, this just follows from, I mean, are you comfortable with how it's defined when S is a field? Yes. Well, I think it works just, just the same. You need, you, need, you need to know, you just, you use, in, in, you, there's an analogous fact for if you want morphisms to relative projective projective space, they they, they correspond to um, yeah yeah the, uh, yeah you, there's a functorial description of this relative projective space and yeah uh, I don't want to get into it right now but yeah it it it, it follows in a similar way that. Uh, yeah, as as if S is just a, a point, right? You use the relative, you use the functorial description of relative projective space. Okay then. Yeah, I'm not. I don't want to go into all the details right now because it would be a yeah a bit of a detour. And in fact, I don't. <laughs> this yeah. In fact, I don't even want to use that. I'm not going to use this embedding. You know, I, maybe. Maybe you were sort of ahead of the game and you're suggesting, you know, like the way we proved that MG was an algebraic stack was using these, uh, this, this property of families to, to embed MG into, to, to express MG as a quotient stack of a certain Hilbert scheme mod, mod a, a PGLM. We could do the same for MG bar or M, and MG N bar, but we're going to proceed by a, a different method. So yeah, we, we yeah, um, and in fact, the way we're gonna we're, the way we're gonna do it is we're gonna show that the entire stack of curves is algebraic, and then what we need to know is that the nodal locus is open. Oh wait, actually, we know that the nodal locus is open. We we need the refinement that the stable locus within the nodal locus is open, and that's what I want to get to next. So yeah, so here, so we need openness of stability for families of nodal curves. 
and so I, I take a, a family of n nodal n pointed nodal curves, and I want to argue that the locus of points in S such that the fiber is stable is open. We first realize that the locus where these points are distinct and smooth uh, is open. So in other, this, this allows us to assume that C to S together with the sections is pre-stable. And now I'll, I'll give actually two different arguments for why it's open using two of the characterizations for stability. The first is going to be the, using the automorphism group. So uh, I take the relative automorphism group C over S preserving the sections sigma one to sigma N. This is a relative group scheme over S. So here I'm going to use that this is a finite type uh, group scheme, which you need to show. That, yeah, it's a set. Yeah, it's a separate argument. I, I'm going to skip that here. And uh, since it's a group scheme, there's a section here, so the normal sem semi continuity arguments actually imply that if 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 you look at the function from just the set S to Z, that takes a point to the dimension of the automorphism group of that fiber. Uh, then th this is upper semi-continuous. And what that implies is that the locus where that dimension is zero, so S and S, such that uh, CS sigma I S is stable, is identified with the locus of points S where this where the dimension is zero. And, th and therefore this is, uh, therefore it's open. And, and the second condition I could have also, rather than looking at the finiteness, uh, finiteness of the automorphism group, I could look at I, the, I have this family of curves and I could look at L, which is the relative dualizing sheaf. And I know that ampleness is an open condition. Well, that, actually, let me twist by the mark points. And then, so the condition that S, such that LS is ample on CS. We've showed that this is exactly the locus uh, uh, where the curve is stable. Uh, and so again, we get that it's open. Any questions? I think I'm actually doing well for time today. I have one more topic. Yeah, and what I'd like to discuss uh, is automorphisms, deformations, and obstructions for stable curves. And so uh, this is our, our last topic today. And like, like you know, for, for yeah, the automorphisms, the deformations, and the obstructions you know, for a stable curve, just like any variety, are governed by these, by these groups, by these X groups. And, and what I want to show is that we can calculate the dimension of these X groups for an endpointed stable curve. I know what X0, X1, and X2 are. 
and we're going to um, yeah we're going to use this later we're going to apply this uh, because if x x0 being 0 implies that there's no infinitesimal automorphisms we already know that the automorphism groups are finite but this tells us that they're even non reduced and that 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 was the condition that's going to allow us to conclude that MGN bar is a DM. And if the X2 being zero, uh, oops, tells us that there's no obstructions to deforming. And uh, I'll, I'll spell it, I will spell it again when we actually apply this, I'll, I'll spell this out more precisely. This applies via the formal lifting criterion for smoothness that MGN bar is smooth. And X1, because it's smooth, we can calculate its dimension as uh, by, by computing the tangent space. And the X1 calculation will tell us that the dimension of MGN bar over a field is equal to 3G minus 3 plus N. So that's that's the reason we're doing this calculation. But today, uh, all I want to compute is yeah, I just want to compute the dimensions of these groups. And I'm gonna I'm gonna do it again just for simplicity. I'm gonna make the assumption that n that yeah, just because I don't want to keep writing all the mark points, I'm gonna take n equals zero. And so yeah, I'm going to first prove the i equals zero case, and you know, repeatedly in every step of the argument, we're going to sort of use this picture here. I take the normalization. Uh, this sigma is is the set of all nodes, and sigma tilde is its preimage. And and so and we view like c tilde with sigma tilde as a pointed normalization. Where I'm sort of when I write that, I'm sort of implicitly assuming an ordering of sigma tilde, an ordering of the points in sigma tilde. Uh, right. So that is so what we need is the claim here. We need to identify the claim is that uh, that, that there's an identification that homomorphisms from a big omega c into O c are the same as homomorphisms from the uh, the twisted Chief of differential to OC tilde. In other words, you know, what this says is that regular vector fields on C are identified with regular vector fields on C tilde vanishing at pre images of nodes. Um, but um, it, you and you you can you can show this directly just using properties of the sheaf of differentials and how they behave under you know push forward and pull back under the normalization map. Uh, but I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip the calculation here. I'm gonna skip the claim, I'm skip the proof of the claim, and just tell you how we use the claim. So the claim implies the following: that if um, oh that sense. So what? So yeah, one of the critical hypotheses here is that we're starting with an endpointed stable curve, and by that exercise, we know that the pointed normalization is also stable, or each each connected component is stable, and this implies that H one of uh, that there's an identification of this group here with what I'm writing here, H1. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the point is that the reason we work on the normalization is that omega C becomes a line bundle. And in particular, then I could take it to the other side. 
And so this is identified with H zero of T C tilde twisted by negative tilde. And this is zero because it's because the degree of this is because it's stable, the numerics in, imply that the degree of this is less than zero. Okay, that was the I equals zero case. Okay, we're gonna jump to I equals two and then and then move to I equals one. So we're gonna have to compute, we wanna show vanishing of X two and we're gonna, I'm going to use a spectral sequence. I think it's the only time in this course we'll use a spectral sequence, but it's a relatively simple one. So, so we're going to use the following local to global spectral sequence of X and the, and the, and the sheepy X. Sorry, can, yes. can I interrupt you? Is there some assumption on G? Because for instance, uh, uh, if I take uh, C to be smooth, for instance, setting P1. Uh -huh. Is that zero? Well, no, no, uh, there's no condition on G only, but the condition is that the curve, the pointed curve is stable. I see, I see. Okay, sorry, yes. So yeah, yeah, like if you do this calculation, that the same thing won't hold for just P1 with no marked points. Yes, thank you, sorry. Right, so we, we have a, a local to global spectral sequence where the on the E2 page, the PQ, I take uh, HP of the Shifi XQ. And the fact we're using is that the spectral sequence degenerates to XP plus Q, right? And this is the, what it converges to is what we're trying to compute. And we're going to use, uh, yeah, and we're going to compute the individual terms of the on the E2 page. And the, the first observation, which I've already written, is that since the dimension of C is one, all cohomology vanishes uh, when P is greater than one. So E2 PQ is zero when P is greater than one. So I've drawn this, yeah, the spectral sequence here. So we have vanishing to the right. This is all zero. And I think if I get the arrows right, I think that the maps go down to the right. Um, and oh, and actually, we all we, we already know that this group here is zero. We've computed that, and and to compute I, but to compute i equals two, the relevant information is on these two terms, right? This is the interesting stuff when i equals two, because these give you the factors of the filtration of of the of the x two, uh, essentially. All right, so let's let's see if we can compute them. Let's first look at e two one comma one. That's h one of c of shifi x one of omega c o c. Okay, and and I actually claim I claim that this thing is, is has dimension zero support uh, because. Well, that, yeah, because first of all, omega C is a line bundle away from the nodes. And so therefore, like if, if I take C in Z and, I, and, and this, this, this fact that if I take, this is a sheaf on C, if I localize the X sheaf at Z, it's the same as computing the local X groups And for points, if, if Z and C is smooth, yeah, then this is a line bundle and this X group is va vanishes. So, so that you're only getting, so it's, it's only supported, this sheep is only, this X1 sheep is only supported at the nodes. And therefore, if you take H1 of it, you get zero.
Okay, now we need to look at E21. Uh, now, now we need to, to compute E220. And we're going to use the fact that, yeah, since C is a curve, uh, and, and nodal, it's a local complete intersection. And this implies that there exists a locally free resolution. Uh, maybe like this of the sheaf of differentials on C. Maybe I should say explicitly what you can do is like if you have a point P in C, which is a, uh, well, you can find an open subset of C uh, and an embedding into side AN defined by an ideal sheaf I, and then you have that omega on U is surjected by the restriction and its kernel is exactly I mod I squared. Or if you prefer, you can even do this calculation formally locally, and then you can use the fact that we know exactly what the, the, the formal local ring is at a node, and you can just compute the relative sheaf of, of differentials of the structure sheaf of that uh, yeah, the, that complete local ring, and uh, and you see that there's a two-term resolution. But that's good for us because we're, we're we we want to compute uh, the, the this term is is what is h zero of of sheaf e x two of omega c o c, and what this tells us is that this the sheaf e x two just vanishes. And so that we get that this term vanishes. And all together, this is implying that x2 omega c oc is zero. I think that the indexing might be, be a bit wrong unless I'm confusing myself. Um, like of the spectral uh, sequence? Yeah, like e like e two zero should be zero just because like p equals two is greater than one, right? Like, should it be e zero two? Uh, oh, yes, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, the indexing is wrong, yeah. Yeah, this is zero two, right? We're, we're after, let me highlight it over here. We're, 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 yeah, we're, on, we're, we're computing what's in the green here. That's e two zero two. And so this right. is also, I think that was the only mistake, right? The indexing. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think that's right then. Okay, yeah, it makes sense. Thank you, Grant. All right, one calculation left is the I equals one page. And, uh, but let, let, so we, for the I equals one, maybe I'll highlight it in purple, is, is are these two guys. So this is what we need to understand with I equals one. In fact, they're both going to be non zero. But we, what we can use is that you know the low degree terms of the of the spectral sequence gives us gives us a, a nice exact sequence, namely it gives us it gives us the following. So what that spectral sequence gives us is is an exact sequence like this, what's written out, um, and let me just like write down explicitly what this one is. This is the H one of the sheafy x zero, or of the hum. Uh, this is h zero of sheafy x one. Okay. And so let's understand this, yeah, sort of term by term. Oh, we also know that this guy, that the, the term on the right vanishes. This is zero. And on that last page, we also showed that this sheaf here has dimension zero support. And since you're taking global sections, that's the same as taking global sections. I could just take the, the product over all the nodes. So I'm, I'm carrying, yeah, up in the top right corner, I sort of recall the, the basic setup. Uh, the sigma is the set of nodes, sigma tilde is its pre-image in the normalization. So when, if Z is a node, uh, 
yeah, this is exactly the H zero of X. This is just X one of Omega C Z localized at Z. Are you with me so far? And so, yeah, this is uh, the, the local X calculation, but I could, if I want, I could also complete this. This is, I, there's an identification like, like this as well. And this completed sheaf of differentials is equal to the sheaf of differentials of the completion. Okay, and now, so, yeah, and, and I'm gonna now, so I relate some of these terms to infinitesimal deformation theory. So it, it, we, we know that this group here, this X1 group classifies first order deformations of C. And so what we mean by that is just a, a deformation over the dual numbers. So an element of this group can be thought of, you know, here I have C over my field. I can include into the dual numbers and I could, and suppose I have a flat family and a Cartesian diagram. That's an element of this X1 group. So I'm, I'm using some, yes, yeah, the facts about first order deformation theory. But, you know, note that on, on the right hand side, this X1 group is of the same form. It's, it's X1 of, of the relative, of the sheaf of differentials and the structure sheaf. So this is, this corresponds to first order deformations of the, of the singularity of the completion of C at Z. And what this map is, and this is, yeah, I, yeah, you can identify this map where this takes this map to the first order deformation, which is of the singularity uh, where now I, now I complete the total family of C of script C at Z. Great. Okay, now, so I have a short exact sequence and I have this interpretation in terms of deformations. And so that allows me to think about this kernel uh, on the right hand side here. I can identify that with first order deformations. So this is first order deformations of C that preserve the node. But we have another description of that at, as you know that the first order deformations that preserve the node induce first order deformations of the of the pointed normalization. So this is equal to first order defs of the pointed normalization, which is identified with with x one of uh oh let me write it here. X, X1 of omega C tilde shifted by sigma tilde of O C tilde. These are, these are equal. Ooh, okay. <laughs> and now to wrap up. Uh, so yeah, the upshot here is I had a short exact sequence. Just keeping the most important terms. And the, my, my goal is to compute this is my goal. I need to compute this def this dimension, and the way I do it is by computing the the two terms. So let, let's do it. Uh, let's first start with the right hand side. So each of these x groups is is one dimensional. This is just like this is. You can do this as a local calculation using a resolution of the sheaf of differentials of the uh, of the of the complete local ring of a node, and therefore the, this whole group. It's just his dimension is the number of nodes. All right, so the tricky one is the left-hand side, this group. Well, but the, the, the point is that, uh, yeah, this is a line bundle. So we can, we can because we're on the normalization, we can compute its, its dimension. Well, let's, let's do it carefully. So this dimension. So to do it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it on the components separately. Uh, so C tilde is the disjoint union of, a, of connected components C tilde I, and let's let sigma I tilde be the restriction 
of sigma tilde to C tilde I. And then the X group is just the sum of the X over the connected components. So this is the sum over the connected components of X one of omega C tilde I shifted by. Okay. And here we use that it's a line bundle to identify this with H1 of T. All right, and now I could use shared duality. Okay, there's several ways to do this calculation. I'm just choosing, yeah, this path is not necessarily the most, yeah, the minimum number of steps. But if I use shared duality on this H1, then this is H0 of omega C tilde I tensor two shifted by sigma tilde I. I mean, I could have just applied ser duality to the X one if I wanted, but now I can apply Riemann rock to this because this thing has positive degree, there's no H one. So Riemann rock tells me that this is just the sum over I of the degree of C tilde I tensor two shifted by the degree of this, so everything in parentheses, plus one minus the genus, so I'll write this as GI. This here is the genus of C tilde I. And the degree of the relative sheaf of, of differentials is two times the genus minus two. I multiply that by two, so I get like four copies of a G minus one, but then I'm subtracting a G minus one. So I'm left with sort of the sum over I, so inside here I have three G tilde I minus three. Uh, and then I have the size, how many points are over nodes in C tilde I. Okay. And then, so th this calculation, this, this then becomes, okay, I have three times the sum of G tilde I over I. Uh, and then I subtract, I'm subtracting three a bunch of times. I'm subtracting three exactly the number of times of the components. And note that for every, for, no, for every node, there's two pre-images in the normalization. And since I'm summing over all the connected components, the core, the, the, uh, the part that, uh, th this, this gives me as I sum over I exactly two times the number of nodes. Ooh, okay, so I got the left-hand side and the right-hand side, and this wraps, to wrap it up in green, I get that the dimension of this is equal to three times this sum minus three number of components. Okay, let me, plus, and I'm, I, yeah, on one hand, I have two nodes, coming on the left-hand side and then another number of nodes on the right-hand side. So I, act, I, I get plus three times the number of nodes. And then, yeah, I, then, then for, by the genus formula, this is three G minus three, because by the genus formula, G was, is the sum of the G tilde I's uh, minus the number of components plus the number of nodes and then there was a plus one. So I think everything works out and you get three G minus three. And so this gives us the dimension of MG bar even over the locus of st stable nodal curves. Now, and 